Please welcome CEO of Worldwide Consumer at Amazon, Jeff Wilkie. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to Remars. Woo! Did you uh, did you enjoy the presentations last night? All right, great. I thought they were terrific. Well, I'm thrilled that each of you is here uh, this week. We invited you because each of you has significant contributions to make to the conversation on AI and ML. Whether you're an astronaut, uh, AI scientist, or a CEO. And by the way, I looked through some of the titles. My favorite one was CEO and Chief Geek. You know who you are somewhere out there. Some of us have been working on AI for decades. We're only in the beginning stages of truly understanding the potential for this technolo technology to change our lives and to help us work on some of the most important and urgent problems that humanity faces. At Amazon, we know we're one of just many voices working on this problem. So ReMars is an opportunity for us to come together, to share, and to learn from each other. Let me take a minute to introduce myself. I'm one of the other Jeffs at Amazon. More officially, I'm CEO of the worldwide consumer business. This includes Prime, Robotics, Fulfillment, Amazon Business, Amazon Go, Whole Foods, Prime Air, and of course, Amazon.com, Amazon Germany, Amazon Japan, and more. Altogether, these groups account for more than 600,000 Amazonians. We're kindred spirits. Amazon is a company founded by computer scientists and incredible coders. And increasingly, we're propelled forward by pioneering work of AI scientists. Over the next 60 minutes, you're going to get a look at how AI has shaped Amazon. You'll see how AI guides our shopping experiences and accelerates how quickly we can get packages to customers. You'll get the latest intel on Alexa and our voice recognition efforts. And along the way, you'll see some really cool demos of new and upcoming products, and you'll get a glimpse into our future. Amazon, Amazon has been a technology company from the start. It helps that our founder was a computer scientist. Uh, I grew up as a programmer, that's me. This is my Timex Sinclair 1000 computer. Anybody in the room have a Timex Sinclair 1000? Yeah! All right, so if you had one, you know it had, my version had 2K of memory. It was not useful for writing machine learning algorithms. Um, by the way, I look at this picture, and I'm guessing that Jeff already was connected to some massive storage in the cloud. And if you had one of these, uh, I had to use the tape recorder, my dad's tape recorder, in order to save data, and it wasn't very much data. Uh, the best thing I, I did with this, uh, in about 1,900 bytes, I wrote a video poker machine after vi visiting Vegas uh, with my grandparents. And uh, it hadn't helped me at all this week, unfortunately. When I first showed up at Amazon in 1999, I led our global operations team. I started to ask questions about how we decided where to place inventory and which warehouses, fulfillment centers, to assign orders to. It was especially important to get this right during our holiday season when capacity is so constrained for us. We didn't have much in the way of operations research uh, or formal applied math teams at the time. We were relying primarily on SKIP. Let me explain skip briefly. Skip is not an algorithm. Skip is a dude. <laughs> skip Broadhead, great guy. Skip had a model of the whole operation in his head. And when you had to rebalance the work or solve a problem, you'd walk into his office, you'd explain the situation, uh, and he could intuit exactly where we needed to go. He would figure out what we had to change, what knobs to turn, and he was usually right. But after my first holiday, I was pretty convinced that Skip was not going to scale. So in 2000, we set up an operations research team to begin to work on improving the algorithms that ran our operations. We joked that we were working on an auto skip. OR was the right field of applied math to figure out how to minimize the cost of inventory and the cost of delivering orders from our supply chain and fulfillment networks. But even OR could only take us so far. We were on path to 200 fulfillment centers, 20 inbound cross docks, 100 sort centers, on a path to deploying more than 200,000 robots, 
and simultaneously creating more than 300,000 jobs in our fulfillment centers. Our use of automation and robotics by reducing the need for our associates to walk from point to point or to push heavy loads of packages improves the safety and the productivity of those jobs, and it lets us pay higher wages. A similar approach has led to some great improvements in the customer experience on Amazon.com. Let me explain what I mean by looking at the evolution of product discovery. Product discovery was heavily based on human curation and bestsellers uh, when we started. Customers would browse selection in a physical store or online that a merchandiser chose based on intuition, data, and trends. But this method was inherently biased toward the merchandiser's own preferences. It failed to capture some niche interests like mushroom picking or board games. The very first recommendation engine that we built using collaborative filtering was considered revolutionary 20 years ago. It was an early version of a machine learning algorithm. That recommendation engine helps customers discover related items, like a camera bag or the lens for a camera that a customer had just purchased. It's still on the site, and it's still a huge help for customers. When we later combined collaborative filtering with heuristics to make recommendations, we were able to give customers personalized recommendations rather than just showing them popular items. Fast forward a few years. Add in the exponential growth of computing power provided by Amazon Web Services, plus the improvement of sophisticated machine learning algorithms. And we start to get dramatically better results, on the order of two times better than a typical algorithmic improvement. That's a once-in-a-decade leap. That helps us to personalize our content and recommend uh, goods that a customer uh, would like to buy and movies that a customer is more likely to watch. Let me explain how we achieved these goals. And it wasn't a straight line to realize the improvements. In 2012, we wanted to update our product recommendation algorithm to improve personalization for customers. We started from state-of-the-art graph clustering techniques. Then we shifted our approach under the hypothesis that deep learning methods would outperform matrix completion methods because we could take advantage of nonlinearities. But we found this approach performed worse than not only our best collaborative filtering algorithm, but just a simple bestseller, a ranked list. Then we used a, a common artificial neural network called the sparse autoencoder. But it was still not as effective as collaborative filtering or the bestseller list. In fact, we tried methods based on singular value decomposition, bilinear regression, and restricted Boltzmann machines. Nope. None of these matrix-based, uh, matrix, matrix completion-based methods underperformed or overperformed compared to our production algorithms and simple lists. We were surprised that the state-of-the-art methods would perform worse than a simple bestseller list. So it prompted us to take a step back and think about the objective function that we were trying to solve. We looked inside the black box to identify what was happening. I'm going to explain this in the context of Prime Video, but the same approach applies to many products on Amazon. We found that matrix completion methods learned that classic or Oscar-winning movies would be of interest to many customers. Makes sense. However, we saw that given an evening at home on a rainy Saturday, customers prefer to watch a newly released movie rather than an old movie. In other words, Captain Marvel beats Casablanca. This learning became the foundation of our winning approach. We developed a new model for recommendations using multi-layer neural networks for classification. We trained the model using a loss function for predicting what customers wanted to watch in the next week. What you see on the screen is the formulation behind the model. We took historical movies that, cust that customers were watching in order to predict the movie a customer wanted to watch next week. The neural network classifier outperformed other neural network-based approaches that are much more complicated. The simplicity of this model made it inherently more scalable, so we could expand to many millions of products and hundreds of categories across Amazon and it performed two times better than collaborative filtering. So we had a winner. After we developed machine learning technologies across Amazon, we didn't sequester our scientists in their own group, separate from the business. Instead, we embedded them in the business teams. We integrated scientists with the folks who are building our products. And like all of our businesses, 
These teams start with customers, an idea for a better customer experience or a customer-focused product, and work backward. They start with a customer experience that we'd love to deliver at launch, not the machine learning algorithm, and then evolve the approach over time. Our machine learning scientists invent for customers first, but they do get the chance to publish academic papers along the way. And one of the best parts about my job is that I get to read the abstract of every scientific paper that, uh, that we publish. Two years ago, I learned about the work our team was doing with generative adversarial networks, GANs, to uh, allow rec reconstruction of fashion images in varying styles. You'll see a really cool real-world application of this technology in a few minutes. For the rest of the hour, we'll focus on three specific areas where we're deploying AI and machine learning. Uh, these, these areas are all about the customer experience in shopping, delivery, and voice. So let's stay in the shopping world for a bit. People do not shop the way they did back in 1995 when Amazon started. They don't shop the way they did in 2015. We started as a bookstore. We're now a collection of Amazon stores, including Amazon.com, Amazon Go, Whole Foods, and more. And we make it easy for customers to buy just about anything they want from virtually anywhere and have it delivered wherever and whenever they want it. Think about this challenge. When shopping for clothes, customers are often inspired by the fashion looks they see in photos, but they struggle to find styles they can't describe in words. This past April, we launched StyleSnap, which is a new feature for our iOS mobile app users. This feature lets customers shop for apparel simply by taking a screenshot of a look they like. Customers can take inspiration from magazines, websites, social media influencers, and then match the looks that they love with items that are available for sale on Amazon's store. StyleSnap uses computer vision and manifold learning to identify an apparel item and recommend similar items. When a customer uploads an image, we use deep learning for object detection to identify the various apparel items in the image and to categorize them into classes like fit and flare dresses or flannel shirts for me. We then find the most similar items, visually similar items, that are available on Amazon. We use a deep embedding model to determine visual similarity. We've trained this model to ignore the differences between catalog quality images and lifestyle images, and instead focus on the unique color, style, and pattern elements that customers are looking for. StyleSnap's deep learning approach learns to capture subtle style attributes, like the shape of a neckline or the size and pattern of polka dots uh, on a dress that would be really difficult to describe with words. StyleSnap's a great example of how we're making shopping even more intuitive. The simple customer experience that results belies the complexity of the technology underneath. So I've described how Amazon has used machine learning over the years, and then shown you some of uh, the things that we're doing to make the customer experience in Amazon stores even better. Now I'd like to introduce Dilip Kumar, who will take you on a first ever public look behind the technology and invention that powers Amazon Go. Thank you, Jeff. Good morning. I'm excited to talk to you about Amazon Go and our Just Walk Out technology. Many of you have likely heard or even shopped at one of our checkout-free Amazon Go stores where you could walk in, take what you want, and just walk out. But how did this come about? Well, several years ago, a small group of us got together to brainstorm ideas of how we could improve the physical store shopping experience. Now, physical stores, as you all know, from a customer standpoint, they're very well served. There's a lot of options, there's a lot of choices, there's a lot of formats. But the one thing that kept coming back again and again is that people don't like to wait in lines. It's not a very productive use of their time, and frankly, it's the least enjoyable part of their shopping experience. So we decided to do something about it. And in typical Amazon fashion, we wrote a press release which envisioned a customer experience that said, what if people could walk in, take what they want, and just walk out? No stopping or waiting in line to pay. What you see today is the output of several years of invention. Today, 
We have 12 Amazon Go stores in Seattle, Chicago, San Francisco, and most recently in New York. Customers love the experience. They describe it as magical. And for the associates working in the store, they can focus their time on more value-added activities, such as stocking shelves or helping customers discover new products, which further bolsters their experience. Our problem was very simple to describe. If you knew the customer account that was shopping in the store, and you kept track of all the interactions that they had with the products, you could tally it all up and send them a receipt when they left the store. But invention on behalf of customers is seldom linear. On most days, honestly, it looked like this. In the early days, we had many different competing technology choices on how to solve the problem of who took what. But early on, we settled on computer vision because we had a strong hypothesis that if executed well, it would provide us the perfect palette on which to build the seamless customer experience. So over the next few slides, I'd like to give you a sense for some of the complexity that went behind making Amazon Go. As I said, the first problem that we needed to solve is to know who the customer account is, or more precisely, the customer account location. In order for us to generate accurate receipts, we needed to keep track of the interactions that you have with the products and associate those interactions to the nearest customer account. Easy enough to visualize. But the store usually looks like this. It's a little more complex. The green circles represent anonymized 3D point clouds, which are the output of the computer vision algorithm's prediction of customer account location. Now, every once in a while, those green circles turn yellow because there's uncertainty associated with that prediction. There's also uncertainty in associating the specific interaction that's happening to the right customer account. If this problem wasn't hard enough, we also had a very strict latency budget because people are moving around continuously, actions are happening continuously, and when people get very close to each other, there's simultaneous actions that are happening when multiple people are picking items in very close proximity to each other, events that are very close in space and time. So we had to build several computer vision algorithms that utilize both geometry and deep learning to not just accurately predict customer account location, but also be able to accurately associate the interactions that customers had to the right customer account. The second class of problems that I wanted to talk to you about was the what was taken, or the object identification problem. Now, in a grocery store, there is a large number of items that look surprisingly similar to each other. Uh, and the similar the item is, the closer they tend to get merchandised. Now, the very act of you picking up an item might in and of itself occlude or partially occlude the one distinguishing characteristic that it has with its nearest neighboring variant. Products also come in different shapes and sizes. Some of them are deformable, some have large specular reflections, and in a physical store environment, illumination changes constantly happen. There's sunlight, there is people casting shadows. Now, life would have been easy for us if every time that a customer picked up an item, they would oblige us and hold it to the camera so that we could get a good look before they put it into their bags. But we were very stubborn on the vision that we wanted customers to shop as naturally as possible, which, of course, increased the, drastically increased the degree of difficulty for our algorithms. Now we had to deal with motion blur. We had to be able to integrate different views in order to figure out how to sort of resolve the occlusion that is happening. And of course, stores are not static. Stores are constantly introducing new products. So we had to find ways in order to be able to identify new items with very little data. Data. That's the third thing that I want to talk to you about. Now, machine learning algorithms, by and large, are designed to improve with more data. Now, as our application grew in accuracy, and we have a very highly accurate application today, we had this interesting problem that there were very few negative examples or errors which we could use to train our machine learning models. So we created synthetic data sets for one-off, hard, challenging conditions, which allowed us to be able to boost the diversity of the data that we needed. But at the same time, we had to be careful that we weren't introducing artifacts that were only visible in the synthetic data sets, but that didn't translate well to real-world situations. 
a tricky balance. Shifting gears for a second. Our machine learning algorithms and our computer vision algorithms don't get to showcase their potential if they're not also backed by a robust infrastructure, which we also had to build. So I'm going to take the next hour or so to go over each of these boxes in excruciating detail. <laughs> no? No, I'm not going to do that. All right. A couple takeaways from this slide. The first is we had to build a highly available distributed system that is capable of ingesting data from tens of thousands of sensors, be able to balance computation on device and in the cloud, and be resilient to networking blips, be resilient to camera outages, and anything else that might be going on in a physical store environment, but still generate accurate receipts for customers. In addition, we also had to build complex session management of knowing who's entering, who's leaving, are they shopping alone, are they shopping in a group, what are the events that are happening, and of course, all the other retail scaffolding that's necessary, which is the, what are the products that are being introduced to the store, how do we handle pricing, how do we handle merchandising, and inventory. Now, each of these problems was hard, but they were essential for us to be able to hit the accuracy bar needed to make this customer experience work. Critical. I lied. None of this was the hardest problem. The hardest problem for us was that to take this entire complexity and to be able to make the technology recede completely into the background so that when you, the customer, came into the store, the only two things that you cared about was the app that you needed to enter the store and the receipt that you get at the end the rest of your shopping experience is largely unchanged, with one key difference. When you're done shopping, you could just walk out. There's no stopping or waiting in line to pay. There's a saying at Amazon that it's still day one, and it certainly is day one for Amazon Go and our just walk out technology. We're very early in our pursuit of excellence, but Amazon Go is a very practical example of AI, where if you start with a genuine customer problem, of people not wanting to wait in lines, you can use the power of computer vision and AI and machine learning to build a stellar customer experience that your customers love. Thank you. With that, I would like to introduce Jenny Freshwater, who's going to be talking to you about forecasting and how it powers Amazon's worldwide supply chain. As Jeff described earlier, we've come a long way since the days of Skip, or even Auto Skip. Think about managing the supply chain in the context of Amazon, a global company that operates in more than 80, 185 different countries across the globe. Our customers, perhaps many of you, don't know or even want to know how the right products ended up in the right place for them before they click the Buy button. This means that our systems, our AI systems, are hard at work well in advance of any customer order. Our forecasting systems have to predict the appropriate amount of demand for each product that we sell worldwide. Our buying systems must determine how much product to purchase and from which suppliers. And our suppliers range from tiny mom and pops operating out of their garages to large manufacturers and brand owners. Our placement systems have to figure out where to put the product so it's as close to our customers as possible. And finally, we have to produce an accurate delivery promise, so our promise systems are also hard at work. Managing this complexity becomes increasingly more difficult when you think about the context of Amazon, when we have Prime, where we offer one-day delivery in some cases, or in the cities where we're operating Prime now, where that delivery promise is an hour or less. This is what makes AI an absolutely indispensable tool for us. All right, let's take a couple of product examples. It would be, my job would be relatively easy to forecast demand to produce a single day promise on products whose demand is very predictable. Or you can imagine linear. Take laundry soap, trash bags, crackers, the things that people buy all the time, household items or even, highly season, even seasonal products, like wool socks in winter or sunscreen in summer. 
We know enough about those demand patterns to be able to put those products in the right warehouses close to customers to make that one day promise. Unfortunately, forecasting is not that simple for all products. Consider some of the variables involved in whether we stock an item and where to have that product in inventory. We have to account for price elasticity. Take the case of TVs, a product that's highly sensitive to price variations. We also need to be able to differentiate between slow moving products that some customers want sometimes and products that just won't sell at all. Take this pickle flavored lip balm. Um, this may shock you all, but it is not a top seller. <laughs> and we need to disaggregate, disaggregate the national demand to regional. We have to forecast for over 10,000 zip codes across up to a dozen different delivery options. Now we're going to talk about two of our hardest challenges that we face in forecasting. Those are predicting demand for new products and estimating demand for highly seasonal products like Halloween costumes. You never know which products are going to spike because of happenings in popular culture. Imagine if the latest season of Game of Thrones would have just launched before Halloween, the increased demand we would have seen for Game of Thrones costumes. This is actually why we started deploying AI and machine learning in our forecasting systems back in 2007. It was to tackle these two very difficult problems. The development of our first machine learning model, which was called Sparse Quantile Random Forest, or SQRF for short, represented a significant innovation for forecasting. We based it, as the name implies, on the popular random forest algorithm that enables decision trees. But we were able to make this algorithm scale to uh, billions of training examples. We were also able to handle sparse data with missing input values that allowed our forecasting systems to consume information from product descriptions and titles that had previously been inaccessible. The final thing is we were able to get a full probability distribution. We don't produce one forecast. We produce a distribution of outcomes. And SQRF enabled us to produce that distribution for any point in time along the year-long forecasting horizon. So SQRF was very useful in exploiting similarities with training samples using text-based data. But it wasn't able to borrow the statistical strength of other products across the time series. Therefore, we evolved our models. And we started to use deep learning, or, or neural networks. We began deploying deep learning networks in our forecasting in 2015. And since then, we've seen a step change in accuracy. The year we deployed deep learning, we saw a 15 times improvement than we'd ever seen in previous years. This forecasting accuracy translates to our customers in terms of higher availability of the products they want, faster shipping speeds, and ultimately, what we all want is lower costs. In 2016, we built a feed-forward neural network, or FNN model. With FNN, we were able to predict distributions for millions of products by outputting quantiles across multiple forecast start dates and planning periods for combinations up to a year ahead. Again, FNN was very successful, but it also had its limitations. FNN required months of manual training. In other words, for every new use case or every new country that we deployed, we actually had to spend months of our scientists' time developing the models, training the models, before we could put the new model into production to benefit our customers. So as we do at Amazon, we evolved to newer and better models. Our current models, the newest models, are built around convolutional neural networks. They have automated feature engineering, which reduces the manual effort, and they access historical demand directly, which enables us to learn across products. For example, long history products, we can learn for new products and vice versa. A practical example of this is take digital cameras. They're constantly coming new to the market. When a new digital camera comes to market, we can use the demand history from the previous version to forecast for the new product. So this sounds great. We have models that learn on their own and, um, and produce accurate forecasts. However, these 
while we've, while we've been building these automated and fully trained models, our team's actually tripled in size because we need more smart scientists to build the next evolution of forecasting models. We're still hiring, by the way, so feel free to send me a resume. Our work here is far from done. We know that deep learning in its current state in our forecasting systems has several limitations that our previous systems didn't. The first and most obvious is these black box models are far less explainable than models that we had previously. This means that small changes in inputs can generate large changes in outputs that we can't fully explain. So to solve for this, we've invented some human levers so humans can provide inputs to our forecasting models. Take an example of a, a new book. It's written by a celebrity or a well-known author. That author often goes to social media or talk shows to discuss and advertise for the book. Our models couldn't possibly know that there's a media blitz surrounding the new release that might drive demand. So this is where our, that humans can provide inputs to our models so that when this popular new book releases, it's available for our customers on the day of release. Okay, so what's it all mean? My team forecasts for over 400 million products every single day for worldwide customers. It's clearly impossible for a person or even a team of people to create new, unique forecasts for each of these, these items. So for niche products, like this Nicolas Cage magic reversible sequin pillow cover, if we had to do forecasting manually, we probably wouldn't spend much time forecasting for, for Nick Cage. Um, but a neural network that's trained on the appropriate loss function can access thousands of other products that are similar to this one and produce a reasonable enough forecast so that we can be sure that if one of our customers in Las Vegas clicks by, there's a good chance we can have it on our doorstep within two days. So I think you can see that on the logistical challenges we take on on a daily basis, AI is an absolutely critical tool for us, and we couldn't do it without it. So now that I've explained the science behind forecasting, we'll show a short video to see how we use AI in our fulfillment centers. Most people look at an Amazon fulfillment center and imagine all the stuff inside. When I look at it, I see data. I'm Russell Algor, chief scientist with Amazon Worldwide Operations. There are one to four million bins per fulfillment center and on the order of 10 million items. We have computer vision systems analyzing images to help us securely keep track of where everything is. Since our fulfillment centers are set up largely on a Manhattan-style grid, the paths that the pods can follow is relatively structured and organized. So the first decision I have to make is which orders I want to pick at the same time in order to get the items in the same box. And that's a large combinatorial optimization problem that I have to solve, and I'm solving in real time. Using that information, we try to minimize the distance the pods have to travel. We have decision engines and decision logic, AI optimization that's running to make those decisions in real time on a constant basis as the information underneath changes. We may build predictions of an action of how likely am I to need to access this pod in the next hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. Once we put a label on the box, the transportation execution systems and processes all have to take over. So we'll use machine learning to build information about how long it takes to travel from point A to point B. To make the magic happen and get prime shipping in one day, we need to better use all of that information which machine learning and optimization at scale enables us to do. Now, please join me in welcoming Brad Porter, head of robotics, onto the stage to talk about some exciting new advancements in the area of robotics. The AI that goes into our uh, forecasting and placing of inventory is truly amazing. If we think of that as the brains, then the heart of our operations, what we like to refer to as the symphony of humans and robots working together to deliver customer orders. 
Amazon really got going in a big way with robotics in 2012 with our acquisition of Kiva Systems. Kiva's technology, which we now call Amazon Robotics, enabled a step function change in how much inventory we could store in a building, while also making jobs easier and safer. Uh, as Jeff mentioned earlier, uh, we're excited to share today that we have now deployed over 200,000 uh, robotic drive units since 2012. But again, it's a symphony of humans and robots working together. Uh, and in that same time frame, we've added over 300,000 full-time jobs. But robotic drive units aren't the only robotics we've been deploying in our buildings. Uh, I'll share a couple examples of other systems we've deployed and are excited about. The first is our robotic palletizer. The robotic palletizer is an industrial robotic arm that stacks yellow totes of inventory onto pallets. Um, as Jenny mentioned, placement, how do we get the inventory to the right place? Uh, this, these, these stacks of totes are used to, to transship between our facilities. These robotic palletizers have now lifted over two billion pounds of totes, again, making jobs easier and safer for our associates. In fact, safety really goes into everything we're thinking about in robotics. Uh, we were excited to roll out last year our robotic tech vest, which allows associates to uh, walk safely onto the robotic floor, confident that the drive units will detect them and move out of their way. But we can't stop here. Customer expectations for convenience, selection, cost, and especially delivery speed uh, continue to increase. And so we realized we needed another step function change in robotics, this time in middle mile logistics. Amazon's middle mile network is really the backbone responsible for connecting our more than 175 fulfillment centers with the thousands of last mile delivery nodes, be them post offices, or our own delivery stations. The core of effective middle mile logistics is package sortation. We sort billions of packages a year, and the challenge in package sortation is how do you do it quickly and accurately? In a world of prime one day, accuracy is super important. If you drop a package off of a conveyor, lose track of it for a few hours, or worse, you missort it to the wrong destination, or even worse, if you drop it and damage the package and the inventory inside, we can't make that customer promise anymore. Uh, just <laughs> deeply disappointing uh, to not only our customers, but ourselves. Um, and so we needed something new. We're also, within our middle mile network, there's a lot of different scale of, of of fan out. We need to, uh, in some facilities, sort to tens of destinations and others, uh, hundreds of destinations. So we needed a solution that was going to scale to all that. So I'm excited today to announce for the first time our new Pegasus drive sortation system. The Pegasus system uses the same Amazon robotics technology, but instead of moving pods of inventory, it moves packages to sort destination. Let me, let me take you through a little bit more how this works. An uh, associate inducts a package onto the drive. The drive moves across the robotic field and, uh, and then is ejected into a chute representing a sort destination. We collect all the packages at the bottom of that chute, destined for one uh, destination, move it to outbound transportation, uh, typically to a truck. The we were able to get this solution up and live, and I'm excited to announce this is, this is live. Already these drive units have, uh, have driven over two million miles in, uh, in service of package sortation. Uh, we were able to get this up and running very quickly uh, due to our investment in simulation. Through simulation, we were able to design, uh, test, and evaluate the safety of our induct stations for our associates, and do that combinatorial optimization that Russell described to efficiently route drives from the induct station to their destination sort point, minimizing congestion uh, on the floor and maximizing the throughput of the system. 
And the results are in the system just works better. Uh, already, this technology reduces uh, missorts by more than 50% over our conventional sortation systems. But in developing this, we also realized we had an opportunity to rethink the way we design robotic drives at Amazon. So again, for the first time for the Remars audience, I'd like to show you our new Xanthus drive. The Xanthus drive is much thinner profile, a third the number of parts, half the cost, easier to maintain, but preserves all the safety features of our existing drives, including the ability to detect uh, the robotic tech vest. But what we're really excited about with this is that we're going to be able to use it in multiple applications. The first is a uh, XSort drive. So by putting a, conveyor, uh, a package conveyance top on top of this, we'll be able to deploy this in our Pegasus sortation systems, um, the new ones going live soon. The, we're also going to be able to use this for multiple different robotic applications, uh, mobility applications throughout the uh, throughout our network. But with our recent acquisition of Canvas technologies, we expect to be able to combine this uh, drive platform with the uh, AI and the autonomous mobility capabilities that Canvas technology provides. And for the first time, allow the robots to move outside of our robotic drive fields and interact collaboratively with our associates to do a number of mobility tasks in our building. I'm super excited about everything we're doing in robotics. I could spend all day talking about it, but at this point, I think I'm going to hand off uh, to my friend Rohit Prasad, who will tell you about what we're doing in Alexa AI. Inspired by RDJ yesterday night, I've decided Alexa will give this entire talk. <laughs> the inspiration for Alexa was the Star Trek computer, where we imagined a scenario where customers could interact with services and devices just by voice. To bring this ambient computing vision to fruition, we brought and invented a lot of technologies. All of it came together with the Amazon Echo in 2014. Now, Alexa is even more ubiquitous. It's available in more than 80 countries and speaks 14 language variants. Hundreds of devices have Alexa built into them. There are more than 60,000 smart home devices that are compatible with Alexa. Through Alexa Skills Kit, Hundreds of thousands of developers worldwide have adding skills to Alexa. Through advances in machine learning, Alexa is more than 20% more accurate over the last 12 months. Alexa is becoming an indispensable part of our daily lives. Customers interact several times with, Alexas, with Alexa across many different skills and domains. We are focused on four AI pillars to improve the customer experience further. First, customer trust is paramount to us. We want full transparency and want to provide full controls to customers to understand and control their information they share with Alexa. Just recently, we launched an Alexa privacy hub, which makes it easy for you to understand the underlying uh, technology and the control you have it on its own, the data, or your own data. Just recently, we announced also that now you can delete what Alexa heard by just telling Alexa, delete what I said today. Another very convenient way of deleting voice recordings, which was a functionality you already had in the companion application. The second key pillar is to make Alexa smarter as you use Alexa. We are doing this with a major paradigm shift. With deep learning, there's a huge reliance on labeled audio or labeled uh, data. 
And we are making it simpler for Alexa to learn faster without human labels. The first example is in speech recognition. We invented using the teacher-student uh, modeling paradigm where Alexa learns with labeled data a teacher model, and then on millions of hours of unlabeled data, it is able to improve accuracy much faster and much higher, which is essentially 10% more relative improvement in accuracy by using the unlabeled data. Huge paradigm shift for how Alexa learns. Another key one is for Alexa to learn directly from customers. Imagine a scenario, this actually happens in my house, or where when my kids were there, like young, they would say, Alexa, play the ABC song, and Alexa wouldn't understand it. But if I paraphrase the request that Alexa, play the alphabet song, now Alexa learns these for, uh, semantic equivalents automatically, and there's no human in the loop to learn this new technology, this new intent that is essentially all about making Alexa learn faster. Alexa is also getting more proactive and more useful by incorporating context of who, what, when, and where. Let's take this example of what we call hunches. In hunches, essentially, you can imagine a situation where Alexa lets you, informs you, like, I think you left that garage light on. If you're moving to your bedroom, this is super useful, where Alexa detected this anomalous pattern and informed you right away. Another example is the Alexa guard feature. This is where Alexa now detects sound events, like glass breaking or a carbon monoxide alarm sounding. And then, just by listening on device through neural networks, it then sends you a notification. Now, much more peace of mind, and it's Alexa again being useful for you. Ultimately, for AI assistance, naturalness is key. You should be able to know what exact skills it has, and use them as naturally as possible. We have done many important strides in this area. First is where now you can issue multiple intents within a single request, like turn on the lights and play Hootie and Bluefish. This is, again, very much driven by a deep learning technology that's parsing this type of complex request. Second. For a lot of skills, you had to remember to say, Alexa, the skill name, before you interact with it. Now we have removed that for many thousands of skills, where you can just say, Alexa, start cleaning, instead of saying, Alexa, ask Roomba to start cleaning. The third area we have made it more natural is now with semantic retrieval techniques. You can just say, Alexa, when do I have to go to mom's house? independent of how did you create that personal event, either through a calendar or a reminder or a to-do list, just naturally it gets you the right event. Alexa is getting more and more natural at single-shot requests. But we imagine a future where you would be able to converse naturally with Alexa just as you do with your family members, store employees, or your friends, where it will be able to complete more complex tasks where you can simply say what you want, shift different, different topics, make choices and decisions. We have made this super simple for developers to build skills. Take an example through Alexa skill set and Atom movie skills ticket, which is a great skill for uh, ordering movie tickets. Today, with Alexa skills kit, you have to define a large set of entity types, intents, the prompts, and also hard code the entire dialogue flow. The Atom Skills Ticket, which is built with this current Alexa Skills Kit technology, requires 5,500 lines of code and 800 examples of sample label data. Today, I'm super excited to announce the developer private preview of a new deep learning-based automatic dialogue flow induction technology that makes it super easy to encode dialogue flow with less effort, less code, less training data. The way this works is that the developer-provided data is now used to train a recurrent neural network, and the entire automatic dialogue flow that is now what's making the dialogue happen instead of hard hand coding. 
there's 3x less lines of code. From 5,500 lines of code, you go down to 1,700 lines of code. There's an order of magnitude less annotated data points. The way this works is the developer provides and declares a set of actions, uh, uh, brings their APIs, a few interactions that customers will have with their APIs. Then an automated dialog simulator generates many more dialog paths automatically so that the developer doesn't need to think about how are the different possible ways my customers will interact with my skill. Then a neural network is trained and deployed. And with self-learning and developer in the loop, feedback loops, the technology just gets better. Your skills perform much better than before. This is a big leap for conversational AI. But customer interactions are not limited to a single skill, and their goals are often unknown. Imagine a situation where a customer is trying to plan a night out. The first utterance she may say may start off by saying what movies are playing nearby. But this is not just a movie request. She may then want to organize uh, a whole night out, and for doing th that today, she has to first interact with a movie skill, then a ride hearing skill, or a restaurant booking skill. So a lot of similar information of time, location, which movie is being transmitted over and over again to different skills, uh, and all the cognitive burden is with the customers. Now, we have advanced our machine learning such that Alexa can predict this goal and make it proactive to surface different skills so that the interaction becomes seamless. Let's, for the first time, take a look at how that would look. Alexa, what are the showtimes for Dark Phoenix on Saturday after 9 p.m.? Here are the showtimes for Dark Phoenix on June 8th after 9 p.m. Get me two tickets for 10.35. OK. Two adult tickets for the 10.35 p.m. show of Dark Phoenix on Saturday, June 8th at Regal Cinnabar Palace Station will be $21. Should I book the tickets? Wait, how long is it? Dark Phoenix is one hour and 52 minutes long. Actually, what are the showtimes after 7 p.m.? Here are the showtimes for Dark Phoenix on June 8th after 7 p.m. Get me two tickets for the 705 show instead. Okay. Two adult tickets for the 705 p.m. show of Dark Phoenix on Saturday, June 8th at Regal Cinnabar Palace Station will be $21. Should I book the tickets? Yes, please. You will receive an email from Adam Tickets with your tickets. Will you be eating out near Regal Cinnabar Palace Station? Yes. Find me a Chinese restaurant. Here are some Chinese restaurants near Regal Cinnabar Palace Station. Tell me more about Mot 32. Here's more information about Mot 32. That looks good. Give me a table at 6 p.m. Okay. You'd like a reservation for two at Mot 32 at 6 p.m. Should I book it? Sure. You will receive an email from Open Table with the details. Would you like a cab to Mot 32? Yes, get me an Uber. Sure, I'll get you an Uber X for two from home to Mot 32, which will cost about $8. Is that okay? Sounds good. Your Uber X will pick you up at 5.42 p.m. Anything else? Show me the trailer. Now playing the trailer for Dark Phoenix. Ladies and gentlemen of NASA, this is Charles Xavier. Help is on the way. I know we all wanted that entire movie to continue, but we have to move on. <laughs> so the interaction you saw there would have taken 40 plus turns if the customer was interacting with discrete skills. Here, it took only 13 user turns, much fewer minutes. Huge simplification and a shifting of cognitive load from customers to Alexa. What I I just want to go behind the scenes a bit on how this makes and uh, how we made it happen. Here, imagine in the situation where Alexa booked me a movie ticket started. 
What Alexa is doing now is that in addition to the recurrent neural networks for each skill, it also has a cross-skill action predictor, where based on what the customer is saying or where you're in the dialogue, it reactively brings up a skill when you ask for a movie tickets or proactively surfaces a skill when you're thinking, when Alexa thinks that maybe after the movie ticket, you'll be ordering a cab or booking a restaurant. All of this seamlessly happening behind the scenes. What I just showed you is not just a vision video. We'll be bringing this experience to our customers soon. And I also wanted to thank all the early developers that worked with us to make this happen. And I look forward to working together with all of you to bring many such magical experiences to customers and uh, to our customers. And with that, I'd like to bring Jeff Wilkie back. And thank you very much. Well, I'd love to thank my colleagues, Dilip, Jenny, Brad, and Rohit for their presentations. Uh, Rohit, that was a terrific demo. Thank you. This team has invented skills and then reinvented them, which is kind of new for us. I want to highlight something you might have noticed in each of these presentations. Behind all of this invention is the computing and machine learning horsepower provided by Amazon Web Services. AWS is the foundation behind many Amazon technologies, including all the ones you saw today. So I'm an optimist. I believe these technologies will continue to transform our lives for the better. We're committed to democratizing AI, making it available to even the smallest startup and even developers. Machine learning is, without question, one of the most powerful and interdisciplinary tools humans have ever created. It holds the promise of conquering the most daunting of challenges, like exploring space or curing cancer. I think a lot about the role that commerce should play in the growth and development of AI as a tool for building a better world. Throughout history, technology invented in the lab only gains broad acceptance when it finds a meaningful public application. And this is true whether we're talking about penicillin or neural network algorithms. I believe corporations can and should be pioneers of machine learning, and that their discoveries should, in turn, benefit society at large. Consider the work we do with personalization for customers. That same work may help create a new ML method that enables personalized treatment for individual cancer patients based on their unique genome, medical history, or specific tumor that they're battling. Similar machine learning algorithms are already being used to aid in differential diagnosis and identification of tumors. So yes, let's appreciate the victories that machine learning delivers in automating business processes and improving ROI and delivering a better experience for customers. But let's also encourage every CEO, every ML scientist, and every corporate citizen to think about how their work can sharpen machine learning to make it the very best tool we have available for solving some of humanity's most important problems. But we still need to be vigilant to ensure the products and services we're developing are worthy of our customers' trust. We must build with accuracy, diversity, and fairness, and privacy in mind from the very beginning. We talk with customers, researchers, academics, policymakers, and others to understand how best to balance the benefits of artificial intelligence with any potential risks. Some examples include our partnership with the National Science Foundation for research grants based on fairness in AI. And we've joined with companies and organizations like Microsoft and Apple, the Allen Institute for AI, OpenAI, and others to form the partnership on AI. As machine learning continues to fuel new ideas and increase in capability, we also have a responsibility to build a workforce able to harness this growing domain. We need this new generation of AI experts to come from a range of experiences and backgrounds and to be representative of a very broad spectrum of communities. Last year, we launched Amazon Future Engineer, a program designed to ensure all students have access to a computer science education. We, don't, we want to inspire more than 10 million kids to explore computer science through coding camps and online training. We'll fund courses in computer science 
for more than 100,000 young adults in high schools uh, across the U.S., 2,000 high schools uh, that are all in low-income areas. This spring, we awarded 100 students the first Amazon Future Engineer Scholarship. Four years, $10,000 per year for each student studying computer science. The first of these, uh, this class has already started their internships at Amazon. <laughs> Today, I'm excited, I'm thrilled to uh, let you know that we're joined by Leo Jean Baptiste, uh, who's one of the 100 scholarship award recipients. Let's take a look at Leo's story. I walk to school almost every day. It's not the safest neighborhood. Sometimes it can be a bit frightening. Leo is, in all my years of teaching, the most amazing student that I've ever had. He's brilliant. My name is Leotin Jean Baptiste, but I also go by Leo. I'm a student at Orange High School in Orange, New Jersey. It does get difficult at times worrying about money and mostly worrying about taking care of my brothers. There's been times where I've felt like giving up He's always sitting in the corner with a book. I love my mom. She's my hero. She works constantly to make sure that even if we can't afford everything, at least we have a house, we have food. In the future, I think I want to become an artificial intelligence or machine learning researcher. At first, college wasn't really a reality. I decided to apply for the Amazon scholarship because I thought it was a great opportunity. Being able to potentially get an internship with Amazon and just saying I'm an Amazon future engineer, that is something that Leo definitely is excited about. Today, this box all of a sudden came to him from Amazon. Let's do this. Hey, Leo. We just package from Amazon coming today. You're one of the select group of students to receive this four-year, $10,000 a year scholarship. Yes, <laughs> yes. Oh. <laughs> In addition to the scholarship, we would like to offer you a paid software engineering internship. I'm proud of you. <laughs> I'm in the car right now. Leo, I hope Remars is the first step on your journey to become an AI researcher. Congratulations. And by the way, I just heard that Leo uh, was accepted to Stanford University. Congrats. <laughs> so, I'm only going to drone on for a few more minutes. When we first started Prime two-day shipping 14 years ago, it was considered revolutionary. Getting packages to customers faster is important for us, and customers seem to love the improvements every time we get faster. We recently announced that we're evolving our Prime service offer in the U.S. to be a one-day shipping offer. The response has been fantastic. Jenny and Brad showed you some of the technology that's involved in getting packages to customers in two days, one day, or even a couple of hours. Now I'd like to show you one type of technology that we're developing to shorten delivery times even further. We're building fully electric drones that can fly up to 15 miles and deliver packages under five pounds to customers in under 30 minutes. And while five pounds may not sound like a lot, it represents between 75 and 90% of the packages that Amazon delivers to its customers today. We aren't saying that three quarters of our shipments will be delivered by drone but the opportunity is tremendous. Over the last decade, we've invested more than $33 billion in the US, building our world-class fulfillment and delivery network. By year's end, the network will include 200,000 fulfillment robots, 50 cargo planes, 19,000 trailers, and 30,000 delivery vans. These assets helped us to ship more than 1 billion items to Prime members last holiday season. We'll soon add Prime Air drones to this list, plugging into an infrastructure that can help us to scale both quickly and efficiently. 
Scale and infrastructure aside, we know customers will only feel comfortable receiving drone deliveries if the system is incredibly safe. So how do we do that? There are three components that we're focused on. First, we've designed automated drone management system to ensure that there are safe distances between our drones and other aircraft in the area. Second, we build robust aircraft with sophisticated controls that are just as robust and stable and capable as commercial aircraft. And third, and this is the one that I'll spend most of my time on, we've designed our aircraft to be safe on its own. The tech industry is abuzz with all things drones, but not all drones are created equal. Some are remotely piloted drones. Some drones are autonomous, but blind, relying on ground-based communication systems for situational awareness and not able to react to the unexpected. Then there are systems like Amazon's, independently safe. Using a sophisticated sense and avoid system helps ensure that drones, our drones operate safely and autonomously. If the environment changes and the drone's mission commands it to come in contact with an object that wasn't there previously, it will refuse to do so. Building to this level of safety isn't an easy task, of course. But from the start, the choice was clear for us. In order for this to make a difference at Amazon scale, a safe, truly autonomous drone was the only option for us. The sensors we use include visual, thermal, and ultrasonic. No sensor by itself can do it all. And let me give you an example. Fluffy dogs are invisible to sonar. That's where diversity in sensing becomes essential. Our algorithms, using data from our suite of sensors, and also diverse technologies, including state-of-the-art machine learning uh, for object detection. And some of those include photogrammetry, image segmentation, vSLAM, or visual simultaneous localization and mapping, and deep neural networks. The neural networks-based detection algorithms run alongside the other perception algorithms and are very sophisticated. The output is not. The actions our drones take are simple and clear with safety as the ultimate goal. The world is ever-changing around us. This is why we've been guided by a principle that our drones must make safe decisions, even when they're encountering the unexpected. The result of our efforts is safe, predictable behavior in every situation. We designed our sense and avoid system for two main scenarios. Safe when in transit and forward flight, and safe when approaching the ground. When in the air, the drones seem to be able to identify static and moving objects that are coming from any angle or direction. We employ sensor and algorithm technologies, such as multi-view stereo vision, to detect static objects like a chimney or a construction crane. To detect moving objects, like a paraglider or a helicopter, we use a proprietary computer vision algorithm. Let me show you. This video from one of our many data collection flights shows what our sensing system sees when en route to a delivery. It's really hard for humans to see, but there's a moving object on the horizon. Anybody see it? Now let me show you the same video, but with an overlay of our computer vision algorithm. The algorithm detects the paraglider almost immediately. This is one of the vision tasks that computers are way better at than humans. After safely arriving over the target, the drone shifts to vertical descent for delivery. We need a small area around the delivery location that's clear of people, animals, objects, ground anomalies. Uh, we determine this using a stereo vision-based depth map and in parallel our neural network-based algorithms, which are trained to detect people and animals from above. Let's take a look at this technology in action. We see a few different things here, the down-looking sensors view, the delivery area with obstacles, and output from the detection algorithms. On the left side, you see the network-based detections on both thermal and gray-level images. And on the right side, the stereo vision-based detections. Once the customer gets too close, he's detected before the drone gets close to the ground. The drone recognizes that it's not safe so it doesn't descend any further. Customers are notified when the drone is approaching in our system, so we don't expect to see people in the delivery zone very often, but that doesn't matter. We collect huge amounts of data and run millions of sim simulations 
to verify that any situation is covered. So let's talk about wires. A customer's yard may have clotheslines, telephone lines, electrical wires. Wire detection is one of the hardest challenges for low-altitude flights. Through the use of a few novel and proprietary computer vision algorithms, we've overcome this challenge. Now as our dr drone descends into the customer's yard, it recognizes the wire and safely avoids it. We use geometrical computer vision to develop this technology. And while I can't get into the details today, there's a unique physical uh, property specific to wires that can be detected using computer vision. Here's a quick clip of this. Can you see the thin clothesline in this backyard? Our computer vision algorithm can. It's another example of our system de detecting the hazard well in advance with no incident. From paragliders to power lines to the corgi in the backyard, the brain of the drone has safety covered. Now, we've designed many drones since the inception of Prime Air. In fact, more than two dozen. As promised before I finish up, I wanted to leave you all with a little glimpse of Amazon's future. This is our latest drone. So I think this is beautiful, and it's the most elegant and sophisticated system out there today. So what are the advancements? This is a hybrid aircraft. It can do vertical takeoffs and landings, like a helicopter. And it's efficient and aerodynamic, like an airplane in forward flight. It also very easily transitions between the two modes. So from vertical mode for takeoff to forward flight in airplane mode and back to vertical mode. It's a completely new shape. It's fully shrouded for safety. The shrouds are also the wings, which make it efficient in forward flight. The unique design provides six degrees of freedom as opposed to the standard four in a quadcopter. This makes the vehicle more stable and capable of operating in more gusty wind conditions. The propellers are novel as well. They have been optimized to minimize intrusive high-frequency sounds. Because just because you want your package delivered quickly doesn't mean you want you or your neighbors to hear it coming. See for yourself in this new flight video. Here's the transition to forward flight. Super smooth. Check out this turn coming up here. The chase drone, by the way, had trouble staying up with this bird. Now the vertical transition from horizontal to vertical. For a safe landing. You're going to see this new drone delivering packages to customers in months. I want to thank the team for their incredible work on this new drone design. And I want to thank all of you for giving us this time and your attention. The future is right around the corner, and I couldn't be more excited. Thank you.